Hi, my name is Ginger Annis, Veteran Service Officer for Alexander County. Did you know there are approximately 850 World War II service men and women passing away each day? Each of these service personnel have a story, a story about friendships, families, experiences, and achievements. The Veterans Service Office, in cooperation with the Alexander County Government Channel, will be hosting, in a series, several short stories shared by these courageous veterans. So sit back and enjoy our history, our heroes. Hi, my name is Ginger Annis. I'm the Alexander County Veteran Service Officer, and I'm joined today by J. Clyde Fox. Mr. Fox, would you start by telling a little bit about yourself? I have been and done about everything that an old codger could do. <laughs> and I was born in Alexander County and lived off and on at 625, 628-25. And I went immediately out of high school in to the Navy and served in the Pacific just about everywhere. There wasn't many places I did not yet, there were not many places that I missed. And out of all of them, probably the Philippines was the most interesting one. And then I've done a lot of stuff since then, school teaching, coaching, and operating restaurants, and you name it, I've tried it and was reasonably successful in most of it. And that's about the size of it. Still live in Taylorsville. Uh, I've lived at different places, but I live in the Northwood section. Uh, live alone. My wife died of breast cancer five years ago. So I'm doing a little bit of cooking, but not much. Okay. Um, were you drafted or did you volunteer for the service? No, I was going to be drafted, but as soon as high school was out, I said, take me, I'm ready to go, and they did, and I, I still think that was the wisest thing that ever happened, because that was the last year we had 11th grade, you had the option to come back for 12th grade, and I knew I wasn't going to have it, an option to come back, so that was it. Were you married before you joined the service? No, gosh, no, I was 18 when <laughs> I didn't. Too young. <laughs> I didn't even know my wife when I went in the Navy. Um, how many years of service did you have? Actually, it was a little less than three years. During the war, it already started and was progressing rapidly by the time I got through all of the training and stuff that I had to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I've said this to everybody who will listen, that... You can't have a better background than to have a military training and stuff. And I've got hundreds of examples of how you use everything that you learned in some of the experience and training that you had. Mm -hmm. And I talked my grandson into joining the Naval Reserve, which I think is a smart thing for any youngster. And the GI Bill... I'd never been able to go to college had it not been for that. That's the best money this country ever spent. A lot of it was wasted, true, but it still elevated the level of education higher than anything we ever did. Mm -hmm. What was your highest rank that you attained while you were in military? I was a gunner's mate, third class. I wasn't even interested in going any higher because I was happy with doing that. <laughs> Exactly what did you do? Guns of all kinds. I've got some some gun art I'll show you before we leave. The thing that that's one of the things that we all enjoyed is doing making things out of spent brass mm -hmm. casings and stuff. But that's actually one of the best I think that we could have that I could have gone into for my special interest and we had a lot of fun just messing when firing and I spent time in a 
Naval Proving Ground, Proving Ground, Dalgan, Virginia. Terribly interesting. And then went out to the West Coast to get to wait for the ship to be commissioned and work for Butts of course, the American as a, an aircraft place. Made more money working for them and paid, was paid in the Navy and then earned a heck of a lot. Where did you go to basic training? Bainbridge. And then the Dalgren Naval Proving Ground. All kind of experimental stuff. They were just starting to develop rockets and stuff, but it had most of that had to do with uh, anti aircraft guns and that kind of stuff that was still rustic, I guess. Is mm -hmm. The missiles came later. And where where were you stationed most of the time? On board the it was an APA and a personnel attack. Bainbridge, uh, the uh, APA 60, the assault, troop assault. Uh, I was on it most of the time. Mm -hmm. And at least I knew where my bed was going to be, and that's another reason I liked the Navy rather than the Army or Marine Corps. You kind of like to stay put, huh? Well, I, <laughs> It wasn't so much a staying put as you knew what. I didn't like to sleep in a foxhole for one reason. Did you make very many friends while you were in service? No coups of them. You just you couldn't help it. Some of them quote, damn Yankees even made friends with them. <laughs> but we had a lot of difference of opinion. I learned a lot just meeting some of them, mm -hmm. how honorary and cantankerous they could be, but they could still be your friends. <laughs> do you remember any of your superior officers? Do they bring back any memories and why? Uh, I remember several of them. What we ended up with was a number of what we call 90-day wonders. We didn't have about three or four real experienced officers on board the ship, but they were tremendous. The gunnery officer and I were real close friends. And one of the things he liked to do was to sink. He had a lot of floating mines, and he'd call me up to the deck, and we'd spend a lot of time just firing at mines. And he'd fuss at me, of course, I couldn't, couldn't hit it. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, we hit the thing three or four times. This is not going to explode. <laughs> but that kind of stuff was all behind the scenes. It was learning experiences. Right. Um, so where all did you go overseas? About every place in the Philippines except the little island of B-A-L-I. And that's the only place I really wanted to go <laughs> because of the pretty girls there. They always heard about you had the Philippines and New Guinea is probably the worst hellhole of all of them because they, I don't know, I just, there was something about New Guinea that was bizarre. And the Japanese, the war was over for a long time before they'd go and tie themselves in trees and snipe as long as they could. They, several of them they didn't know the war was over for two years or more back, but New Guinea, they could have it. And then, uh, of course, how are you about every time we went anywhere, we had to stop off there for supplies and so on. And the Philippines was the, my favorite. And I've got some paper currency, and I'll give you one. If when, I, when we left the Philippines, the streets were covered with Japanese money. That you wouldn't even pick it up. It was, didn't have incinerators and didn't even try to burn it they just threw it in the street but if wish I'd have known then what I know now you could sell all that stuff <laughs> you could have made a lot of money now huh yeah um, were you any in any battles or skirmishes or anything like that yeah I got four uh, stars for and, and oddly enough some of the cleaning up exercises was really worse than the, the initial invasion because it had already been soft, softened up. Right. And the, uh, 
I don't know, probably Okinawa was, was, was the toughest one. And then we may or may not, the gunner's mates, they were taking the boats and you run them up on the bank as mm -hmm. far as you could. And let them get off, and the more they got off, the more. And by the time you got everybody unloaded, it's floating again. But anyhow, that was. I didn't get to go ashore many times. We generally stayed on ship and let somebody else take the boats in. What what weapons were you assigned to? Weapons. Mm -hmm. All of them. Being a gunner's mate, you had to be familiar with all of the, especially anti-aircraft weapons. 40 millimeters, 5 inch 30, 5 inch 38 was the biggest self-contained weapon that we had, and they were good. They were one of the best anti-aircraft guns on the market. Mm -hmm. And I remember one classic example of that. We were anchored somewhere, I don't remember where, and all of a sudden these two planes came down between two mountains, and there's a destroyer out in the ocean a good distance, mm -hmm. but they fired four rounds and knocked both of them down. Wow. What kind of uh, conditions or hardships did you face when you were on the ship? I didn't consider any of it except uh, hardships, except when you had troops, of course, that was, you, you just stacked them almost one on top of each other until, and we, I don't know how many times you'd bring in, some of them were shell-shocked like crazy, and they'd get all over the place and get in the way, and they didn't know any better. So, what? I don't think anything really, other than a lot of times when we had, uh, had two, I remember, two hurricanes, that was no fun. I thought, when they told us we had to go back out in, in open waters, I thought it was crazy, but I found out later that was to keep us from ramming in, into each other. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, go through any hairy situations or close calls while you were in the Navy? Uh, I don't know really how to define a close call, but we had several. Uh, I guess the closest we came, this one ship came, uh, one airplane came over with two bombs under the wing, and then one went on one side of our ship and the other on the other side, and the, the airplane went into a tremendous troop ship and the superstructure, and they dropped bodies in the water for I don't know how long after that incident, but the close calls were frequent when you were in, in that kind of an environment. Mm -hmm. But I never was really frightened. I thought, well, if I don't make it, that's what. How did you handle being away from home and family? No problem. I didn't, didn't have, uh, which I uh, never really been away from home. The farthest I'd been away from home was the beach, and then one or two times I'd been there, but other than that, I didn't have any real problem with it. And when you make a lot of new new friends, that makes up for it. The ship kind of becomes home at that point, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Um, did faith play a part in in your uh, experiences while you were in the military? Did what play a part? Faith. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't pay too much attention to denominational alignments because when we had services, the preacher may have any kind of a background, and, and we had a lot of interfaith mm -hmm. services. So, yeah, I learned a lot from that experience, mm -hmm. and I've been to a half dozen, mm -hmm. but I've been along with my wife went to belong to the Presbyterian Church, and I went regularly to the Presbyterian Church mm -hmm. with her. What did you do for fun during leave? <laughs> Keep it clean. 
I don't know. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of stuff to do. Uh, had several. They said he had a girlfriend in every port, but I didn't have. There's a couple of ports I didn't have one. <laughs> Did you receive any medals or awards for your time in service? Not anything outstanding, just the usual uh, run-of-the-mill awards. Uh, didn't want to see, didn't want to get a, a Purple Heart or anything like that. But. Right. Do you still have uh, some uniforms or mementos or anything like that from your time? Yeah, I've got a, the thing that I treasure most is a brass collection. That we had a shop that we made all kinds of things, and that's what I'll show you for for your benefit as to what some of the things you can make out of spent brass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he couldn't take them off of the ship until the war was over. They wouldn't let you take any of that stuff off. Were any of your family members or ancestors, were they in the military? Yeah, a lot of them. I, all kinds of ancestors of my uncle was an officer in the Navy. That's one reason I chose the Navy. He was sort of my idol, I guess, and he's the person that says he's volunteer for everything you can do. And you'll use that knowledge and experience in so many ways, and that's proven to be true. Um, and you said you're, you talked your grandson into joining the Naval Reserves? Well, yeah, he's already there and out. And then he goes to, he works at the golf course in Statesville. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the head of the thing is the man with the most money in it has, uh, he's a Naval, uh, not a Naval officer, I can't remember now, maybe, but he's military. Mm -hmm. And he told him when they were fussing about taking up so much time to go to training, he said, you sign up for every training course you can get. And if anybody says anything to you, you tell them to come see me, and it'll start square it away. But I think that's the attitude you got to go in with these youngsters to benefit from, from everything that they can do. Mm -hmm. Are you active in any veteran service organizations now? Not right now. I, I got too dang old to be active. And I used to be real active in it. But I think one of, one of my favorite stories that can illustrate how useful some of the Navy training, I went to one of the best firefighting schools in the country at San Diego, mm -hmm. and then to stimulate abandoned ship drills, they'd fill big old tanks with water and pour oil on them and set them on fire, and you had to let that burn and jump off of an 18-foot tower into that flaming water mm -hmm. and tread and threw water on and just a, a lot of things like that that we had to do mm -hmm. and I was when I was a freshman at Appalachian the oldest building on the campus caught fire big old frame building and the fellow who was head of the volunteer fire department was directing everything it was so cold our pants had freezing ice on them behind and front of them were smoking mm -hmm. and it was a big um, new, relatively new building. This old building was framing and they started smoking. The window sill started smoking and I turned the hose on over those, that building mm -hmm. that the way was smoking and he said twin cockroaches this, this fire chief, he was volunteering, he said, get that damn hose back over here where the fire is. Well, I knew better than that because that building was done and all of the music instruments and stuff was in it, but it wasn't, I just handed the hose to somebody else and walked off because I knew we were going to lose that building. It never should have happened, but that was lack of training and experience. But that's my classic example of how your military training and experience can be useful later. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the youth today about uh, the military or about joining the armed forces? I'd encourage them it just for that reason alone. The military training and discipline is 
I don't know, somebody, we've got so many kids now that are not disciplined at home or anywhere else, and most of them need that. I didn't have any problem with it because my mother made me do whatever she said. <laughs> you knew better than to misbehave, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I did encourage them to go in if, if it's just for a short time. I don't think there's much danger of them being called overseas into action now within the next several years. I can't foresee us getting involved in anything else. We've bungled things. Not we, but some of our decisions have not been too wise either. Do you have anything else to share with the citizens of Alexander County? No, I think it's the best place in the world to live, and I've lived a half dozen other places. It's a place to rear children, and you couldn't find, I could not have found a better place to have grown up. And I'm just thankful for all of the experiences that I've had. And I'm really pleased with the, the people now that are serving over there. I don't think our country is giving the GI Bill or giving the GIs too much help for Veterans Administration, especially because they're letting some of them down miserably. And one example of, of that, when I went to Salisbury to try to get some help with hearing aids, which was a result of uh, an experience an accident in uh, Alvin, Virginia that was totally related to stupidity on my part and mm -hmm. the civilians worked there too but anyhow they told me to come back in two weeks or something and when I went back down there they, didn't, they couldn't even find my record <laughs> that's oh, just mercy. typical of, of, I'm sure you know that better than I do some of the things that go on now mm -hmm. and the mental health structure just it does not lend itself to GIs coming back home with mental defects or problems. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest regret of what's the shortcomings right now. Mm -hmm. Damn hose back over here where the fire is. Well, I knew better than that because that building was done and all of the music instruments and stuff were in it, but it wasn't. I just handed the hose to somebody else and walked off because I knew we were going to lose that building. It never should have happened, but that's lack of training and experience. I mean, that's my classic example of how your military training and experience can be useful later. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the youth today about uh, the military or about joining the armed forces? I'd encourage them. It just for that reason alone, the military training and discipline is, I don't know, somebody, we've got so many kids now that are not disciplined at home or anywhere else, and most of them need that. I didn't have any problem with it because my mother made me do whatever she said. <laughs> you knew better than to misbehave, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I did encourage them to go in if, if it's just for a short time. I don't think there's much danger of them being called overseas into action now within the next several years. I can't foresee us getting involved in anything else. We've bungled things. Not we, but some of our decisions have not been too wise either. Do you have anything else to share with the citizens of Alexander County? No, I think it's the best place in the world to live, and I've lived a half dozen other places. It's a place to rear children, and you couldn't find, I could not have found a better place to have grown up. And I'm just thankful for all of the experiences that I've had. And I'm really pleased with the, the people now that are serving over there. I don't think our country is giving the GI Bill or giving the GIs too much 
help a Veterans Administration, especially because they're letting some of them down miserably. And one example of that, when I went to Salisbury to try to get some help with hearing aids, which was a result of uh, an, ex an accident in uh, Alvin, Virginia, that was totally related to stupidity on my part, and mm -hmm. the civilians worked there too. But anyhow, they told me to come back in two weeks or something. And when I went back down there, they, didn't, they couldn't even find my record. <laughs> that's oh, just mercy. typical of, of, I'm sure you know that better than I do, of some of the things that go on now. Mm -hmm. And the mental health structure just it does not lend itself to. GI's coming back home with mental defects or problems. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest regret of what the shortcomings right now. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to an old codger. Well, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us because we really are interested in, in your experiences because so many of us don't get to do that kind of stuff. Well, I, I think it's if we could just get to these kids and tell them or show them or show, prove them how much they can learn from just even going through boot camp is an unbelievable almost experience. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to have had Red Cross certified lifeguard when I went in because of a lake that we had here at, at at White Plains, you can't remember that, but there used to be a big lake down there. And, uh -huh. and anyway, I did all kinds of things that, uh, because most, and it's hard, for most people to believe it, but most of the sailors could not swim a lick or it went in. And we, I, I volunteered to, when I was even in boot camp to, to go down to the pool. We had big you know, outdoor or indoor pools and you try to get them to jump in and they wouldn't do it, and you'd just get a hold of them. And of course, they had big May West life jackets on. You get a hold of them and jump in with them and turn loose before we hit the water. <laughs> <laughs> and then they wanted to stay there and go on and on. Of course, you couldn't spend the time with that. But that's some of my most memorable early ones. Uh-huh. But you make an attitude is largely what you get out of, what anybody gets out of in the military. You go in to learn and take advantage of everything you can. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get back, well, you just don't get back. That's true. <laughs> and that never bothered me. I mean, I never really was concerned about it. Right. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed it too. We, we did. Sounds like you're bragging, but it, it, so much can be learned from it.